8979 заседание Совета Безопасности объявляется. The 8979th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda of the meeting for today is letter from the permanent representative of Ukraine to the United Nations dated 28 February 2014 addressed to the President of the Security Council S slash 2014 slash 136. The agenda is adopted. On the basis of Rule 37 of the Provisional Rules of Procedure of the Security Council, I invite uh, the representatives of Australia, Austria, Andorra, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, the, uh, um, Belize, Belgium, Bulgaria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Botswana, Hungary, Guatemala, Germany, Greece, Georgia, uh, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Iceland, Spain, Italy, Canada, Cyprus, Colombia, Costa Rica, Kuwait, Latvia, Liberia, Lithuania, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, Niger, Niger, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Poland, Portugal, the federal uh, uh, states of Macronesia, the Republic of Moldova, the Republic of Korea, uh, Republic of Korea, Rom Romania, uh, Samoa, Singapore, Slovakia, Slovenia, uh, Timor Leste, Trinidad and Tobago, Turkey, Ukraine, Fiji, Finland, Montenegro, the Czech Republic, Chile, Switzerland, Sh Sweden, and Ecuador to participate in today's meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. Uh, council members have before them document S2022-155, the text of a draft resolution submitted by Australia, Austria, Albania, Andorra, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, uh, the Bahamas, Belize, Belgium, Bulgaria, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Botswana, Hungary, Guatemala, Germany, Greece, Georgia, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Ireland, Iceland, Spain, Italy, Canada, Cyprus, Colombia, Costa Rica, Kuwait, Latvia, Liberia, Lithuania, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, Niger, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Poland, Portugal, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Moldova, the Republic of Korea, Romania, Samoa, Singapore, Slovakia, Slovenia, the United Kingdom of uh, the United Kingdom in North Ireland, the United States of America, Timor Leste, Trinidad and Tobago, Turkey, Ukraine, Fiji, Finland, France, Montenegro, the Czech Republic, Chile, Switzerland, Sweden, and Ecuador. The Security Council is ready to undertake a vote on the draft resolution before it. I now give the floor to those members of the Security Council who wish to deliver statements before the vote. I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Oops. Colleagues, we are here today because of Russia's unprovoked unjustified, unconscionable war on Ukraine. Let us never forget that this is a war of choice, Russia's choice. Russia chose to invade its neighbor. Russia chose to inflict untold suffering on the Ukrainian people and on its own citizens. Russia chose to violate Ukraine's sovereignty to violate international law, 
to violate the UN Charter. Now, all across Ukraine, people are fleeing for their lives. Residents of Kyiv and Kharkiv have left their homes with only the belongings they could stuff in their backpacks to make shelter in subway stations, which have now become bomb shelters. We've seen reports of attacks on kindergartens and orphanages, babies, newborn babies in an intensive care unit have been evacuated into makeshift bomb shelters too. We have seen heart-wrenching images of fathers sobbing as they say goodbye to their young children and sending their families away as they send their families away to safety while they stay behind to defend their country. In Kyiv today, thousands of people crushed into a local train station with mothers passing their children over the crowd, begging for people to help to get their babies onto trains and to safety. According to the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, more than 50,000 people have fled Ukraine in less than 48 hours. We've also seen everyday Russians bravely speak out and demonstrate in cities across Russia against President Putin's decision to plunge them into a war with their neighbor. They do not want to sacrifice Russian lives for Putin's ambition. This body, charged with maintaining international peace and security, was created to prevent exactly this kind of aggression from ever happening again. Russia's latest attack on our most fundamental principles is so bold, so brazen, that it threatens our international system as we know it. We have a solemn obligation to not look away. We believe to our core that the noble intentions of this institution should still have a place in solving 21st century problems and shielding our children and our grandchildren from the horrors of war. The horrors of war are exactly what our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are experiencing today. The people of Ukraine will soon need food and water and shelter and medical aid. They will face displacement and lose everything they've worked to build. For these reasons, we and Albania, in consultation with our allies and partners, have proposed this draft resolution holding Russia to account for its aggression against Ukraine. This resolution condemns Russia's aggression. It reaffirms the sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And it demands the Russian Federation to immediately, immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw its forces. It also calls for the facilitation of rapid, safe, and unhindered humanitarian assistance to those in need in Ukraine and the protection of civilians, including those who are humanitarian personnel. Today, we are taking a principled stand against Russia's aggression in this council, but many of us are taking actions in our capitals to defend international law, including the UN Charter, and to impose severe consequences on Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. In coordination with our allies and partners, we are imposing severe and immediate economic cost on Russia. These measures include sweeping financial sanctions that will have an immediate impact on its economy and export controls that will cut off Russia's access to vital technological inputs, atrophy its industrial base, and undercut Russia's strategic ambitions to exert influence on the world stage. In addition, it was just announced, as was just announced, President Biden 
will be sanctioning President Putin himself, along with Foreign Minister Lavrov and members of Russia's national security team. These actions are meant to complement the important work we're doing in the Security Council and the resolution we have put forward today. History will judge us for our actions or lack thereof. And so long as we have a Security Council, I believe we ought to strive to ensure it lives up to the highest purposes to prevent conflict and avert unnecessary war. Russia has already subverted that mission, but at a minimum, at, a, at the very minimum, the rest of us have an obligation to object and to stand up for the UN Charter. To those who say all parties are culpable, I say that is a clear cop-out. One country, one country is invading another. Russia is the aggress aggressor here. There is no middle ground. Any doubters, I say look at the kindergarten that was bombed this morning. Take a hard look. To those who say there is a special history between Russia and Ukraine that somehow excuses the war, I say we should all think carefully who, who, the, who that label might apply to next. And as I said on Monday night, President Putin asserted that Russia has a rightful claim to all territories from the Russian Empire. And just a few hours ago, Russia threatened Finland and Sweden with military and political repercussions. Responsible member states do not invade their neighbors. They do not commit violence against their neighbors just because they have the ability to do so. That is the entire purpose of our international system. That is fundamentally the point of the Security Council and the United Nations. So colleagues, this is a simple vote today. Let me put it plainly. Vote yes if you believe in upholding the UN Charter. Vote yes if you support Ukraine's or any state's right to sovereignty and territorial integrity. Vote yes if you believe Russia should be held to account for its actions. Vote no or abstain if you do not uphold the charter and align yourselves with the aggressive and unprovoked actions of Russia. Just as Russia had a choice, so do you. Thank you. I thank you and now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Let me start by stating that the, my delegation subscribes to what we just heard from the Ambassador of the United States. Dear colleagues, we are called today to express clearly and loudly where we, our states, stand individually and collectively with respect to international law that we have agreed to, with the principles enshrined in the UN Charter that we have agreed to, with international norms we have commonly established to govern our relations as independent and sovereign countries, as peace-loving nations, as responsible international actors. As we speak, Ukraine is being bombed, people are being killed, a country in Europe is being destroyed by a more powerful country, its neighbor, that has decided it wants to turn the historic clock backwards, a prominent member of the Security Council to whom the world has given power and trust to decide on peace and security. Instead, that country has decided to rule and inflict death. With its unprovoked aggression, Russia is not only inflicting untold pain and causing an unprecedented humanitarian situation in Europe, it has stained the UN Charter with innocent blood. It is burying the Charter under the rubble of destruction in Kiev 
and other cities in Ukraine. We must say no, and it is not too late to stop this madness. Dear colleagues, the resolution that Albania and the United States, together with many partners, have presented condemns Russia's actions underscores that Russia must immediately cease its use of force against Ukraine and withdraw its forces. It calls upon Russia to abide by the Minsk agreements. It also calls for facilitation of humanitarian assistance to those in need in Ukraine, and their number is growing by the hour, and urges continuous efforts to respond to the humanitarian and refugee crisis that Russia's aggression has created. The resolution echoes the call of the Secretary General addressed publicly to President Putin that in the name of humanity, bring your troops back to Russia. It echoes numerous similar calls at the highest level around the globe to stop war. This is the minimum we can do. We owe it to Ukraine, a member of the United Nations, to its people, to the world. Dear colleagues, this is a defining moment for the Council, and not only. This is a day that will be long remembered on one single aspect, and our children, the future generations, will know who stood up for respect of human life, for international law, for rules, for solidarity with Ukraine, so that children, young girls, women and men, just human beings, live their life free in peace and in dignity. And who did not? This is not a moment to look away. This is a moment to speak, and we call on the members of the Council to support the text so that we say no to aggression, we say no to an unprovoked war, we say no to the domination of a country by a more powerful one. And I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you. The UN Charter begins with a solemn invocation to peace. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save successive generations from the scourge of war. That conviction has been the touchstone of the work in this chamber since 1945. We must not forget that our fundamental purpose here is to protect people and their futures. To protect people from violence and conflict that destroys lives. As we speak, women and children in Kyiv, young families in Odessa, pensioners in Kharkiv, and civilians all over Ukraine are sheltering from Russia's military onslaught. First, Russia claimed this was all Western hysteria. Then they said it was about Donetsk and Luhansk. Now they are bombing Kiev. We have seen dreadful images of Russian tanks crushing civilians in the Ukrainian capital. A country of 44 million people is being attacked on all fronts. Colleagues, the resolution we are voting on today is a message to those people that the world is on your side and stands with the Ukrainian people. It's a message to the world that the rules we built together must be defended, because otherwise, who might be next? It's a message to Russia as well, to the brave Russian citizens who are protesting a war they do not want. This resolution demands an end to this war. Colleagues, President Putin has launched a massive invasion of Ukraine. His aim is to remove its government and subjugate its people. No fog of war is thick enough 
to obscure a truth this clear. This is not self-defence under Article 51. It is naked aggression. It is an unprovoked, unjustified war, and this council must condemn it. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Security Council today finds itself facing face to face with its responsibility in its a capacity to reaffirm the core principles which undergird its very existence. The United Nations were cre was uh, created on the ashes of a brutal war, the main aim of which is to prevent any other deadly act of belligerence. Today, at a time when a number of nations and peoples throughout the world continue to attempt to heal the scars of faraway wars as humanity seeks concrete responses to vulnerability and the manifold fragilities which threaten it, we need neither wars nor any new sources of fear. War is the very denial of the aspirations of people throughout the world. War wreaks death and destruction. The devastation of war and the traumas of war are devastating and frequently irreparable. There is no winner ever in war. War merely revives the pain and making the uh, hellish cycles of resentment all the more infernal. My country is wedded to peace. We are wedded to the principles underpinning the Charter of the United Nations. We are cha we champion an international order that is fairer, a rules-based order. For this reason, today we condemn the war against a member of the United Nations. My country joins its voice to all of those who today will condemn war with the ardent hope that uh, we will reaffirm the principles of the United Nations and that this will never be uh, carried out in different ways in different areas and the principles underpinning our position are equally upheld in for all distinguished colleagues, the international community is called upon to seize this momentum for frank self-criticism so as to ensure that throughout the world, any uh, war of choice, any war of influence, any war of hegemony, any war uh, to seek, uh, for looting over of resources, any war, all wars are dehumanizing. The international stage should not be a reflection of a jungle where nations where nations are either hunter or pr either predators or prey. Mr. President, to conclude, we wish to reiterate our call for an immediate ceasefire, for de-escalation. We beseech the belligerents not to hinder access for, of humanitarian assistance to those people who are in need. We call upon all parties uh, to revitalize dialogue, to embrace a peaceful settlement to their disputes. As for us, distinguished colleagues, members of the Security Council, the responsibilities which of, uh, we need to adopt uh, to assume today should always be reflected in defense reaffirmation and the renewal of our commitments, uh, w w w that is, uh, to save succeeding and present generations from the scourge of war. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, President. Mexico will vote in favor of the draft resolution presented by Albania and the United States, and we will do so for the following reasons. First, we are witnessing one country's invasion of a sovereign country. This is a blatant violation of Article 2 
paragraph 4 of the United Nations Charter, and it is also an aggression under the terms of General Assembly Resolution 3314, which was adopted by all members of the United Nations. Secondly, Mexico has itself suffered four invasions over the course of its history as an independent state, two by France and two by the United States. The first intervention by the United States in 1846 led to the loss of almost half of our national territory at that time. Thirdly, Mexico has always condemned all acts of aggression, as it made clear with its protests at the League of Nations, at the annexation of Ethiopia and Albania by Italy, and the annexation of Austria by Germany. Fourthly, our rejection of the use of force led us in 1945 to convene the Inter-American Conference on the Problems of Peace and War in Mexico City, which then led on to the uh, our going to the San Francisco Conference with a clearly defined regional position on this matter. Five, Mexico's foreign policy is in favor of peace. Since the UN was established, my country has defended and will defend before this organization and indeed in all fora the prohibition of the threat or use of force in international relations. 6. In 1988, we signed into our constitution the principles of the United Nations Charter as normative principles of our foreign policy. As a result of all of the above, Mexico condemns the acts of aggression perpetrated by the Russian Federation against Ukraine. We call on the parties to immediately cease hostilities. We recognize the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine, and we support the efforts of the UN Secretary General to seek a diplomatic solution to spare civilians any further suffering. President, as a result of our own experience and through a constitutional mandate, Mexico will support the draft resolution that we are considering. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we live in unprecedented circumstances of threat to the international order and a violation of the UN Charter. We are gravely concerned with the Russian military operations against targets in sovereign Ukrainian territory. We believe the Security Council should strive to show a united resolve in pursuing diplomatic solutions to all threats to international peace and security and seek agreement also on the Ukrainian crisis. As we hear reports of increasing civilian casualties, fear and devastation in Ukraine, a scenario that any war inevitably generates, our main objective now is to immediately stop ongoing hostilities. How should we do that? First, the Security Council must swiftly react to the use of force against the territorial integrity of a member state. A line has been crossed and this Council cannot remain silent. Secondly, and no less important, we need to create the conditions for dialogue among all involved parties. The world cannot afford a point of no return where parties see military victory as the only avenue to end conflict. During the negotiations of the text, 
Brazil attempted to seek, th seek this balance, to maintain the space for dialogue while still signaling that the use of force against the territorial integrity of a member state is not acceptable in the world today. We are also deeply concerned with Russia's decision to engage troops in military operations on the ground and with the loss of lives and danger to the civilian population that may ensue. We continue to hold a firm conviction that threats and force will not lead this crisis to a lasting settlement. Military action will inflict damage, undermine the faith in international law, and put the lives of millions of people into jeopardy. The mission of the Security Council is not over. If our efforts so, have so far failed to prevent a war, it is our duty to persevere and seek the immediate suspension of hostilities. We should strive to find ways to restore peace to Ukraine and the whole region. We renew our appeal for the full cessation of hostilities, for the withdrawal of troops, and for the immediate resumption of diplomatic dialogue. There is no alternative to negotiation to solve the present crisis. The security concerns voiced by the Russian Federation in the past years, past few years, particularly regarding the strategic balance in Europe, do not give Russia the right to threaten the territorial integrity and sovereignty of another state. The Security Council has a legitimacy to debate and with the goodwill of all adopt measures to redress this dangerous situation. The collective security system of the United Nations rests ultimately on the pillar of international law. The sovereign equality and the territorial integrity of UN member states are not hollow words. It is our duty to give concrete meaning to the high aspirations of the drafters of the UN Charter. That is our most valuable legacy. To rid ourselves from the scourge of war was the very reason for the establishment of the United Nations. In the end, peace and international order must prevail. We shall not rest until this mission is accomplished. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I now will put the draft resolution to the vote. I request that those voting in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2022-155 to raise their hands. Those against? Abstentions? The result of the voting is as follows. 11 votes in favor, 1 vote against, 3 abstentions. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the Security Council. I now give the floor to those members of the Security Council who wish to deliver statements after the vote. I give the floor to the representative of Albania. Dear colleagues, we deeply regret the decision of the Russian Federation to veto the resolution. The Council lost a precious opportunity to show to the world its unity, its power, its usefulness. Instead, it was blocked, it was taken hostage. We are disappointed but not surprised, and this is not the end of our efforts. We will continue to work with the UN Member States, with those who stand for rules and not chaos, with those who base their relations with others on respect and not contempt. We will continue to condemn this aggression, call for ending this senseless war. Russia may inflict damage, kill people, overthrow a legitimate government, try to destroy Ukraine, but as history teaches, it will never be able to kill freedom. Instead, Russia will be held 
responsible for the consequences of its actions. It is already facing worldwide condemnation. It will face sanctions, as we heard, and restrictions, just like the suspension of its rights in the Council of Europe today. But it will not be able to destroy European security, nor will it, nor will it be able to throw the world back. We stand and will stand with Ukraine. And as announced today by Prime Minister Rama, Albania, in its tradition, is ready, if needed, to shelter Ukrainians fleeing the war. In conclusion, let me reiterate that Albania supports the sovereignty, territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. And I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Colleagues, not surprisingly, Russia exercised its veto power today in an effort to protect Russia's premeditated, unprovoked, unjustified, and unconscionable war in Ukraine. But let me make one thing clear. Russia, you cannot veto this resolution. You can veto this resolution, but you cannot veto our voices. You cannot veto the truth. You cannot veto our principles. You cannot veto the Ukrainian people. You cannot veto the UN Charter. And you will not veto accountability. Responsible members of this Security Council have stood together today in the face of Russia's aggression, and we will continue to stand with Ukraine, supporting it in every way we can. We are united behind Ukraine and its people. Despite a reckless, irresponsible permanent member of the Security Council abusing its power to attack its neighbor and subvert the UN and our international system. This vote showed which countries truly believe in supporting the core principles of the UN and which ones deploy them as convenient catchphrases. This vote showed which Security Council members support the UN Charter and which ones do not. We will be addressing this matter in the General Assembly where the Russian veto does not apply and the nations of the world can, will, and should hold Russia accountable and stand in solidarity with Ukraine. Before I conclude, I want to commend the true and tremendous courage we are seeing from the Ukrainian people. I want to thank the Ukrainian permanent representative who is here with us today. Earlier today, President Biden spoke with President Zelensky and personally commended the brave actions of the Ukrainian people who are fighting to defend their country. He also conveyed ongoing economic, humanitarian, and security support being provided by the United States, as well as our continued effort to rally other countries to provide similar assistance. It's hard to imagine what it must feel like to see tanks rolling into your city, to see bombs dropped on your streets, to see so soldiers storm your parks and your gardens. But in the face of all of this, everyday Ukrainian people are taking extraordinary actions to protect their children, to protect their country, to defend everything they hold dear. I also want to commend the courage of the thousands of people in Russia who are protesting Putin's war, despite grave risk to their personal safety. They will keep chanting, no war. They will keep asking how many Russian lives Putin wants to sacrifice for his cynical ambitions. As we move forward, I hope more member states take their cues from this courage and honor all of this bravery with more of our own. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of India. Mr. President, India is deeply disturbed 
by the recent turn of developments in Ukraine. We urge that all efforts are made for the immediate cessation of violence and hostilities. No solution can ever be arrived at at the cost of human lives. We are also deeply concerned about the welfare and security of the Indian community, including a large number of Indian students in Ukraine. The contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, international law, and respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. All member states need to honor these principles in finding a constructive way forward. Dialogue is the only answer to settling differences and disputes, however daunting that may appear at this moment. It is a matter of regret that the path of diplomacy was given up. We must return to it. For all these reasons, India has chosen to abstain on this resolution. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Colleagues, a large majority of the Council has just voted in favour of a resolution aimed at stopping war. The resolution has not been adopted only because of the single veto of the permanent member of this Council who is perpetrating that conflict. Russia claims that its invasion of Ukraine is in self-defence. This is absurd. Russia's only act of self-defence is the vote they have cast against this resolution today. Make no mistake, Russia is isolated. It has no support for the invasion of Ukraine. History will record how we voted today and which countries stood up to be counted in defence of the Charter and the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The United Kingdom stands steadfast in support of the Ukrainian people and will hold Russia accountable for its aggression. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. President, Norway voted in favor of the draft resolution. We deeply regret Russia's veto. Preventing an ending act of aggression is a direct responsibility of this Council. A veto cast by the aggressor undermines the purpose of the Security Council. It is a violation of the very foundation of the UN Charter. Furthermore, in the spirit of the Charter, Russia as a party should have abstained from voting on this resolution. On Wednesday, as we sat here in the Council Chamber, we could see the shocking first images of what now amounts to a full-scale Russian invasion of a free and independent UN member state. We can only imagine the hardship the people of Ukraine is going through. With their tanks, missiles, bombs, planes, warships and cyber attacks, the Russian Federation's aggression not only violates the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, it also constitutes a serious breach of international peace and security. Russia has disregarded the very core principle of the rule-based world order that the United Nations has stood for since the Second World War. Let me be absolutely clear. Norway insists that the Russian Federation immediately, completely and unconditionally stops all fighting and withdraws all of its forces from the territory of Ukraine. Russia must respect the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. Norway expresses full solidarity with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people in the face of Russian aggression. Indeed, we already see the dire consequences for civilians, with casualties and injuries of large numbers of children, women and men. We fear increased suffering in the time ahead. 
with potentially large numbers of casualties and extensive destruction of civilian infrastructure, such as schools, medical facilities, water and electricity plants. We see fighting unfolding in and around urban areas. We are deeply concerned about the long-term and protracted harm to the civilian population caused by such warfare, including by the use of heavy explosive weapons. We already see mass displacement. This will only increase together with trauma, family separation and missing persons. The situation is a tragedy both for individuals and the Ukrainian society at large. The parties to the conflict in Ukraine must comply with their obligation under international law, including human rights law and international humanitarian law, and ensure the pr protection of the civilian population and detainees. Space for neutral and impartial and independent humanitarian action must be protected to ensure safe, rapid and unimpeded humanitarian access to those in need. We condemn in the strongest possible terms Russia's military aggression against Ukraine. This Council must now carry out the great responsibility of its mandate and act in a determined and united manner to stop the ongoing aggression against a UN member state. We also condemn Belarus for facilitating these attacks. Norway will join our allies and partners in swift and concrete countermeasures. This includes the alignment of Norway to the intensified sanctions of the European Union. Let me conclude by reiterating Norway's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Mr. President, Ireland voted in favour of the draft resolution presented by the United States and Albania in response to the flagrant violation of the UN Charter, of international law and of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation has turned its back on diplomacy. It has spurned genuine offers of dialogue and rejected repeated calls from the international community for de-escalation. Instead, it has launched an unjustified and unprovoked attack on Ukraine, an attack that continues today to rain death and destruction on Ukraine and its people. We condemn these actions outright. In casting our vote today, we do so in full solidarity with the people of Ukraine. This Council has a responsibility to act in the face of conflict, to protect international peace and security, to uphold the principles the world agreed upon in response to the utter devastation of the Second World War. This is not a responsibility that Ireland takes lightly, yet it is one that we were prevented from discharging today in spite of the clear and declared will of the great majority of this Council's members. Mr. President, we deeply regret the use of the veto today by the Russian Federation. The veto is an anachronism which has no place in today's world. The use of the veto to block Council action is always unacceptable. Its use today in blatant defence of military aggression is reprehensible. However, the veto in no way obscures the plain facts of Russian aggression against Ukraine, nor will it hinder the international community's response to Russia's blatant breaches of international law, as demonstrated by the broad co-sponsorship of today's resolution by the wider UN membership. In this context, Ireland strongly supports the comprehensive sanctions announced by the European Union yesterday. We stand ready to support further measures if Russia does not reverse course. Mr. President, 
The unfolding horror of recent days is a tragedy for the people of Ukraine, and one which evokes nightmares that the people of Europe fervently hoped had been consigned to a blood-stained history. Only dialogue and diplomacy offer escape from these nightmares. We call on Russia to end its aggression against Ukraine today, to turn away from war and choose the path of dialogue and diplomacy. This is the right path, and the time to take it is now. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le President, at this time, Russian mis mi missiles are killing civilians, bombing cities, destroying essential infrastructure, with the sole goal of making Ukraine a vassal state. These are goals of rebuilding the Russian Empire. Ukraine is the victim of a premeditated aggression initiated by the President of Russia. Nobody can, nothing can ever justify this. No member of the Council supports it. The result of the vote is clear. Russia is alone. France welcomes the mobilization of all members of this Council who, by voting in favor of the resolution, expressed their commitment to international law and their support for Ukraine. We condemn the use of the veto by Russia, vetoing efforts to restore peace and international order. Russia is riding roughshod over its responsibilities as a permanent member of the Security Council. It is manipulating the United Nations Charter, violating the most basic principles therein. President, within the UN and in all bodies, France will continue to mobilize with its partners to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Thank you, Mr. President. Ghana voted in favor of the draft resolution on the situation in Ukraine, which did not pass, because that is the minimum duty we owe to the Charter, the peoples of the world, and in particular, the government and people of Ukraine as a member of this council. We join the 10 other members of the council in seeking to deploy in the strongest terms Russia's, the Russian Federation's invasion of Ukraine because that act breaches Russia's obligation as a member of the United Nations. Its obligation to respect the provisions of Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the Charter. By not refraining from the use of force in its relations with Ukraine, the Russian Federation had chosen to violate without justification the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine even as several world leaders had appealed for dialogue to find a peaceful settlement of the situation. The Russian Federation's actions, which have assailed the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, have threatened the global order and the balance of peace and security. We have also taken note of the Russian Federation's letter presented to the Council that seeks to indicate that its use of force against Ukraine was in self-defense, but dismiss it in the face of all, its all-out military action against Ukraine. We are pained by the unnecessary and rising number of deaths that have been occasioned by the invasion, and we call on the Russian Federation to immediately withdraw its forces from Ukraine and to recommit to dialogue and diplomacy. Besides our own assessment that Ukraine presented no imminent threat to the Russian Federation, the letter is also interpreted within the context of Russia's own public declarations over the course of the past days, which have shown to the world that rather than a security merit, this has been about the use of force against its weakened neighbor, because it could. At the beginning of its military build-up on the borders of Ukraine, we were told that what was being observed was a normal military exercise. 
when concerns over the massive build-up were made, the Russian Federation informed the world that its troops were on its side of the borders and had no intention of crossing the frontiers of Ukraine. At the point, we were also informed that troops were being considered to be sent to the Donbas region of Ukraine in the context of peacekeeping. Today, the whole world knows better. As we met in an emergency session on Wednesday night to afford yet another opportunity for peace, the trust and good faith crucial for diplomatic engagement was broken in a cruel and dismissive manner. The battle against Kiev may yet be won, but the goodwill of the world has been lost. The use of force as a basis for secure international agreement has no place in our modern international order, and the world cannot accept this. Ghana is deeply disappointed by the actions of the Russian Federation, a permanent member of the Security Council. Its actions have fallen short of the higher standards expected of all those states that are considered as the enduring guardians of international peace and security. Indeed, for those members of the Council with a special privilege, there is also special responsibility. I reiterate Ghana's full support for the sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine in accordance with the Charter. At a time that the world looked up to the Council to send a strong message that threats and use of force against other states are unacceptable, we have been unable to do so, not because there is no broad agreement to do so, but because the way and manner the Security Council has been structured to function has constrained us. The present situation creates difficult choices, which we all must consider and carefully reflect upon as we proceed with the long-standing efforts to reform the United Nations Security Council and how it operates. Fortunately, the ongoing process in the General Assembly provides an opportunity, and all member states must genuinely commit to that process. If we fail to act proactively, our inactions would cost us permanently. Before concluding, let me indicate Ghana's continuing concern over the situation of the civilian populations in all parts of the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, as well as the welfare of more than a thousand Ghanaian students and several nationals in that country. We recall that in accordance with international humanitarian law, there are consequences for unlawful actions against civilian populations. Also, as the Secretary General rightly said in his press engagement on Wednesday night, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia would come at great cost to most of our countries. Already, oil prices have gone beyond $100. Inflation in most of our countries have begun to rise. Investment decisions are being pulled back. The already difficult situation of economic stagnation triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic is beginning to worsen. The consequences of these adverse developments is that the fragility of most of our countries will deepen and further risk created for global stability. The actions that have taken place ag against Ukraine are therefore far-reaching and require even greater solidarity. First, with the people of Ukraine who bear the direct and immediate impact of this unjustified action that violates the Charter and the principles of international law, but also for the many especially developing countries whose populations are facing severe austerity. May we find the wisdom and common purpose to overcome the difficult moment we face. Ours is a call for peace. Let's give peace still yet a chance. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Mr. President, Brazil regrets that the Security Council was unable to react to a breach of international peace and security that is still happening as we speak. During the negotiations, Brazil favored a text that could maintain space for dialogue among all the parties, while sending a decisive message for respect to international law and to the basic principles that for more than 75 years 
have saved us from a war of wide proportions. We thank the proponents for their flexibility in several aspects of the draft during the negotiations. Mr. President, the framing of the use of force against Ukraine as an act of aggression in the draft, a precedent that has seldom been used in this Council, signals to the world the gravity of the situation, but could also downplay other times when force was used against the territorial integrity of Member States with no equivalent reaction from the Council. Indeed, we could have ended up with a text that is more conducive to reconciliation. Brazil has fought for that. However, under the current circumstances, not even a different text would have been enough to allow the Council to fulfill its responsibility to maintain international peace and security today. No country, elected or non-elected, with or without veto power, should be able to use force against the territorial integrity of another state with no Council reaction. The Council's paralysis when world peace is at stake could lead to its irrelevance when we need it most. It is our collective responsibility not to allow this to happen. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the serious developments in Ukraine, we all agree, undermine regional and international peace and security. And throughout this crisis, my country has consistently called for de-escalation and dialogue. We placed great hope in the various diplomatic initiatives and channels aimed at resolving the crisis. And those calls reflected our alarm at the consequences of this crisis for civilians present in Ukraine, as well as for the region and for the international community. And we emphasize the importance of ensuring that humanitarian assistance reaches those in need and call on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, prioritize the protection of civilians, and allow for the unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance. We further believe that every member state of the United Nations has the right to security, sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. Being from the Middle East, we are intimately aware of the critical importance of a stable regional security environment and of de-escalation, diplomacy, and dialogue as the basis for that security. Similarly, we understand from experience and share the need for inclusive and consultative processes. We support the draft resolution's emphasis on the need to adhere to the principles of international law and to the Charter of the United Nations. And that must be the basis of the resumption of dialogue and the pathway forward now that that resolution has not been adopted. The UAE restates its commitment to the territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence of all member states of the United Nations. We urge for immediate de-escalation and cessation of hostilities. And we once more underscore our readiness to work with members of this Council towards that goal. The results of this vote were a foregone conclusion. But the avenues for dialogue and diplomacy must remain open more urgently than ever before, and we must pursue them together. This is the clear sentiment that this Council is united on. Thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Mr. President, Kenya has voted in favor of the draft resolution to affirm Article 2 of the United Nations Charter that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. We voted yes to register our opposition to the breaching of the territorial integrity of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. We voted with hearts that are heavy with sympathy for the people of Ukraine. We offer our condolences to all the Ukrainian families that have suffered the devastating loss of loved ones to this unnecessary 
war. Our affirmative vote today transcends the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine. We voted yes also having in mind the justifications for past interventions by other powerful states using resolutions from this very council that seriously compromised international peace and security. Even as deserved condemnations ring out today about the breach of Ukraine's sovereignty, history's condemnations are a loud silence in this room. We cannot help but recall that Africa's Sahel region is in terrible turmoil due to the hasty and ill-considered intervention in Libya a decade ago. On that occasion, the African Union sought more time for diplomacy. Its counsel was ignored, and what resulted was not peace or the safety and security of the Libyan people. Instead, terror was unleashed on African peoples in the countries to the south of Libya. There have been yet other actions of similar magnitude that have brought us to this unfortunate pass. Today, the precious fabric of our charter lies torn and trampled and threatened with further harm if there is no urgent and visionary leadership with a faith in diplomacy pushing in the opposite direction. If the United Nations Charter could speak for itself, it would vote for this resolution to affirm its central role in safeguarding our collective peace. It would remind all members of the Security Council and the United Nations that the Charter contains the tools for the Pacific settlement of their disputes by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements, or other peaceful means of their own choice. By failing to adopt this resolution, we deeply regret that the Security Council has failed to stop the infringement of the sovereignty of a member of the United Nations. I thank you. Thank you. I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, China is deeply concerned about the latest developments of the situation in Ukraine. Now it has come to such a point which we do not want to see. China wants always forms its own position on the basis of the merits of the matter at hand. We believe that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states should be respected and that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter should be jointly upheld. We have always called on all parties to seek reasonable solutions to address each other's concerns through peaceful means on the basis of equality and mutual benefit. We welcome and encourage all efforts for a diplomatic solution. And we support the Russian Federation and Ukraine in resolving the issue through negotiations. In the past week, the Security Council has held two emergency meetings, and all parties have fully elaborated on their positions and concerns on the current situation. At present, Faced with a highly complex and sensitive situation, the Security Council should make a necessary response. At the same time, such a response should also be taken with great caution. All actions should be truly conducive to diffusing the crisis, rather than adding fuel to fire. If not handled properly and treated by bending oneself on exerting pressure and imposing sanctions, it may only lead to more casualties, more property loss, a more complicated and chaotic situation, and more difficulties in bridging differences. It may completely shut the door to a peaceful solution, and eventually it is the vast number of innocent people that will be the victims. We must draw profound lessons from the extremely painful experience in the past. Based on the above mentioned, China abstained in the vote just now. I wish to stress that the issue of Ukraine is not something that only emerged today, nor did the current situation occur suddenly overnight. It's 
It is the result of the interplay of various factors over a long period of time. China advocates a common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security concept, believing, as it does, that the security of one country cannot come at the cost of undermining the security of other nations, and that much less can regional security be secured through group strengthening and, from that matter, group expansion. Against the backdrop of five successive rounds of NATO expansion, Russia's legitimate security aspirations should be given attention and addressed properly. Ukraine should become a bridge between the East and the West, not an outpost for confrontation between major powers. We strongly call upon all parties concerned to exercise maximum restraint, ease tensions, avoid civilian casualties, The final settlement of the Ukraine crisis still requires abandoning the Cold War mentality, giving full attention and respect to the legitimate security concerns of all countries, and conducting negotiations to build a balanced, effective, and sustainable security, a European security mechanism. We urge all parties to return immediately to the track of diplomatic negotiations and political settlement, show sincerity, uh, sincerity and goodwill make a political decision and engage in dialogue and consultation for a comprehensive settlement of the Ukraine issue. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I shall now deliver a statement in my capacity as the representative of the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation voted against the anti-Russian and anti-Ukrainian draft resolution of the Security Council that was submitted today. Why is it anti-Russian? I think that there is no need to explain. Why it suffices to have a, a merely cast a cursory glance at the text. Why is it anti-Ukrainian? This is because the document, beyond any doubt, runs counter to the fundamental interest of the Ukrainian people insofar as it is an attempt to salvage and cement in Ukraine that system of power which which brought the country to the point of tragedy, which has now been ongoing for at the very least eight years now. We thank those who did not support this draft. I will not respond to those who just accuse the Russian Federation of abusing uh, the veto right. Well, the main reason for our negative vote is not the fact that there is what is included in the draft, but what is left out. If its sponsors were attempt to, to were to attempt to make it even remotely balanced, then they would not have left out issues which must be addressed and cannot be overlooked in the context of the Ukrainian problem. Specifically, they would not. Uh, what was left out is the fact that those who assumed and seized power as a result of the anti-constitutional coup in Kiev in February 2014, I refer to the Maidan junta, the way that they unleashed a war against the residents of the country's east, shelling residential areas with artillery pieces and multiple rocket launchers, raining bombs on the people of Donetsk and Lugansk. What was left out was the way that the Ukrainian authorities, with the encouragement of their Western patrons, consistently and cynically shirked their responsibility to implement the Minsk agreements, the linchpin of which was direct dialogue with the residents of the country's east. At the same time, what was positioned on the line of contact, the deployment of Ukrainian death squads, quad squads comprised largely of radical neo-Nazi battalions, methodically, day after day, shelled the residential areas of DPR and LPR, killing women, children, and the elderly. And incidentally, this is ongoing today, just today, four civilians died as a result of the actions of the Ukrainian armed forces. And how can we fail to mention the blood-chilling crimes by the Ukrainian nationalists as perpetrated over the past eight years, the fact that the protesters against Maidan and Odessa were burned alive, the fact that peaceful protesters in Maidan were shot at by unknown snipers? 
The investigation into both of these tragedies is something that has been deliberately swept under the rug by the Maidan regime. At the same time, the culprits in the Odessa tragedy are well known. They are openly flaunting their presence. And yet an alternative investigation and the recognition by the snipers themselves unambiguously confirms that the slaughter on the pla uh, at, at Independence Square was a provocation by the leaders of Maidan. We specifically, last year, carried out an informal Security Council meeting, an ARIA formula meeting, on both of these issues with the aim of sharing with Security Council colleagues more information about this. And yet in response, at best, what we heard from Western partners were merely hackneyed cliches about so-called Russian propaganda. How can there be a resolution on the Ukrainian issue without these above-mentioned issues being mentioned? It would have been wise to include in the draft of all an honest assessment of the role of Western colleagues in inflating this Ukrainian crisis. Not only did they stand behind the Maidan coup, but they also effectively issued a carte blanche to Kiev to carry out any acts, any steps that would be unthinkable for any civilized state. And this includes the egregious discrimination against the Russian language and consequently Russian language speakers. This includes glorification of Hitler's henchmen aligned in, in, uh, alongside the prohibition on, prohibi on processions to honor the real heroes of Ukraine who freed it of Nazism as well as the religious schism in that country. As you spin tales about the triumph of democracy in Ukraine, the Maidan authorities and nationalists have been, with impunity, murdering their political opponents. They have been persecuting the opposition. They have been shuttering opposition television channels where it was possible to at least have some small dose of relatively objective information. Six of them, six of those television channels were shuttered under President Zelensky alone. And how can we fail to mention the fact that weapon has been flooded with weapons, weapons that were used then to kill civilians in Donbass. Donbass, you have made Ukraine a pawn in your geopolitical game with no concern whatsoever about the interests of the Ukrainian people. Responsibility for what is transpiring at present lies not only with the Ukrainian government, but it also lies at your feet, ladies and gentlemen. And today's draft resolution, your draft resolution, is nothing other uh, then yet another brutal, inhumane move in this Ukrainian chessboard. <laughs> Colleagues, today, all Western media outlets have been inundated with reports about how civilian populations in Kiev and a host of other Ukrainian cities have been seeking shelter in bomb shelters and they are fighting for their lives and uh, fleeing artillery fire. We are genuinely empathize with our neighbors and we urge them not to yield to provocation. President Putin and the Russian Defense Ministry explicitly stated and clearly stated that there would be no no strikes targeting civilian uh, infrastructure, but nationalists are already using civilians as human shields. Specifically, we categorically em uh, uh, condemn the placement by nationalists in residential areas of artillery and multiple rocket launchers. This is a direct breach of the norms of international humanitarian law, including Articles 51 and 58 to the first additional protocol of the Geneva Conventions. We see the way the situation is being exploited in propagandistic exercises by Western politicians and media outlets. I would like to ask you, where were you eight years ago? Why were you unmoved when there was murder and artillery strikes in Donbass? Why didn't you even bother to notice that there are four, more than four million people living in DPR and in LPR who at best were branded pro-Russian separatists? Why didn't you repudiate Poroshenko when he said that the people, that the residents of Donbass would rot in basements? Or Zelensky, why didn't you repudiate uh, him when they called them non-people and uh, specimens? Parenthetically, I cannot but note that at the height of propaganda, our colleagues very frequently use imagery from Donbass, brandishing them as alleged uh, consequences of the so-called Russian aggression in Ukraine. These kinds of fakes 
are abundant and proliferating today. They have flooded the internet and a number of uh, telegram channels. And there are uh, videos uh, uh, of Russian alleging Russian strikes targeting residential areas, which were filmed in other parts of uh, the world and in, uh, have nothing to do with Ukraine. This was mentioned today by the British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, having issued an article, Ukraine conflict, many misleading images have been shared online. The, everything is there. There are photographs of parades, of photographs of American aircraft which bombed Libya, and photographs from Syria, and even, even an explosion in Beirut, Beirut, which is being uh, portrayed as uh, what is transpiring in Ukraine. I will send this uh, article to you, distinguished members of the Security Council, separately. And specifically, I wish to turn to my French, uh, French, British, and American colleagues. Uh, the permanent rep uh, representative of France said that in Ukraine, what is uh, taking place is um, the murder of civilians. That is untrue. Russian troops are not bombing Ukrainian cities. And we said uh, that they are not threatened by anything. There is no verifiable confirmation whatsoever about the deaths of civilians. The permanent representative of the United Kingdom, I would note that what you are portraying as what uh, alleging that a Russian military aircraft, uh, military pieces are uh, targeting civilians, I saw the reports today and I would like to report that this you can see from the videos that this is a heavy tank uh, 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 piece, which is called Str uh, uh, Strela 10, Ar Arrow 10. And this is in the possession of the Ukrainian armed forces. The Russian military does not have this kind of equipment. They are obsolete. This is the kind of fake uh, piece of information that you are using, our U.S. colleagues, I would note, that uh, this, with respect to, to the alleged bombing of the kindergarten, that too is fake. Of course, it is difficult uh, for us to uh, compete with the United States in terms of the number of invasions. Uh, t uh, targeting their neighbors. I will refrain from uh, listing out the aggressions carried out by the United States in their history, but you are in no position to moralize. To conclude, I wish to emphasize we are not waging a war against the Ukraine against Ukraine or the Ukrainian people. We are carrying a special operation against uh, nationalists and for the protection of the residents of Donbass for denazification and for demilitarization. These objectives will soon be achieved and the Ukrainian people will be will gain an opportunity to once again independently determine their future. Living and in so doing, to live in peace, good neighborliness, and cooperation with all of their neighbors. I now resume my duties as a president of the Security Council, and I give the floor to the representative of the United States for an additional remark. For additional remarks, <laughs> colleagues, I um, asked to take the floor uh, for a different reason, and I, so I'm not going to respond to uh, the atrocious lies and. Uh, propaganda and misinformation that you just heard from our Russian colleague. What I asked to take the floor for was to uh, recall uh, the names of some of our colleagues who were not named earlier due to the rapidly um, uh, moving uh, response to, to these events in Ukraine. Some of them were, uh, were left off who were sponsors of, of the resolution, and I'd just like to highlight uh, their names because we so appreciate what they have done. Uh, Barbados, Croatia, Estonia, De Gambia, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Japan, Kiribati, Lesotho, Marshall Islands, Monaco, North Macedonia, Palau, Papua New Guinea, and Suriname. I want to thank you and all of you uh, for your support. Uh, we will continue to all speak in one voice in the days ahead 
to address the atrocious situation that we see happening every day on the ground, despite what we've heard from our Russian colleagues. Um, I now thank you. Thank you. And I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Distinguished members uh, of the Security Council, I will not dignify the Russian diabolical script that is rather a letter of application for an upscale seat in the hell by commenting it. I would like to use this opportunity to thank the parents of every ambassador here, to thank the people of the democratic nations who put these ambassadors in their seats, to tell the children of those ambassadors that they should be proud of their parents that they have voted in favor of the resolution. I thank my good friend Nicola from France, Rolando from uh, Brazil, my good friend Haja from Albania, Linda, Barbara, Mona, my good friend from Mexico, Martin from Kenya, Ireland, Ghana, Gabon. I thank dozens and dozens of co-sponsors who would vote in favor of their resolution should they have a chance to vote, but they will have this chance in days to come. The draft recalls the obligation of all states under Article 2 of the UN Charter to refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. The draft called on Russia to stop its offensive against Ukraine. And the memories are very fresh. The Security Council was discussing the ways to prevent the war quite recently in this very chamber. And at the very same moment, deadly airstrikes were dropped on civilian heads across my country. And the Russian troops crossed the Ukrainian border from the territory of Russia. The territory of Belarus was used for missile attacks. And the troops were marching from the occupied parts of the Ukraine's Donbas and Crimea. Last night was the most horrific for Kiev since, just imagine, 1941, when it was attacked by Nazis. Last night was attacked by someone who pretends they are fighting with neo-Nazism. Therefore, I'm not surprised that Russia voted against Russia is keen on continuing its Nazi-style course of action. The Kremlin regime should not be called Russian regime. The Kremlin regime should be called Russist regime. A couple of hours ago, my president said, and I quote, tonight the enemy will use all the forces at their disposal to break our resistance, while cruel and inhuman. Tonight they will storm. We must all understand what awaits us. We have to persevere tonight. The fate of Ukraine is being decided right now." End of quote. We just heard 
something that the Russian ambassador wanted to present, pres present as assurances from himself and from his leadership that it's all provocation. And that he urged us not to yield to, pro pro to provocations. Do you remember how many times he said that and uh, his deputies said in this very room that there will be no invasion, no attacks? Do you remember how during the previous session he was moving, walking out of uh, the chamber trying to call someone, not knowing what was going on? How we can trust you? How we can trust your assurance? You have no idea what is on the mind of your president. <coughs> Your words have less value that, than a hole in the New York pretzel. The Russian Federation that occupied by treachery the seat of the Security Council member in 1991 violates daily not only the charter but also the provisions, provisional rules of uh, procedure of this council. Because if Russia did not violate the provisional rules, then Mr. Nebenzia had to follow Article Rule 20. Let me quote. I begin the quote. For the proper fulfillment of the responsibilities of the presidency, he should not preside over the Council during the consideration of a particular question with which the member he represents, that's the Russian Federation, is directly connected. He, the rule reads, shall indicate his decision to the Council not to preside. So since the Council is not ruled by the current presidency by rules, I will be probably also unruly. And I will ask all of you to dedicate a moment of complete silence to pray or to meditate if you do not believe in God for peace to pray for souls of those who has been already killed for souls of those who may be killed and I invite the Russian ambassador to pray for salvation. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let us spend a moment in a complete silence. I do apologize, but before moving to a moment of silence, I want to include in the list those people who perished over all these years in Donbass. They also are worthy of being mentioned. Any, uh, all human lives are valuable. Let's not forget them either. But let's, ladies and gentlemen, spend a moment in complete silence. Thank you. I thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Let me continue with my statement. I'm saddened However, that there is a small handful of members that seem to be still tolerating the war. 
Any complex history, historical context could not be used to justify what is going on. And I may say to some, it is exactly the safety of your nationals right now in Ukraine that you should be the first to vote to stop the war, to save your nationals in Ukraine, and not to think about whether you should or should not vote because of the safety of your nationals. Nothing could justify missile shellings of kindergarten and an orphanage, hospitals, that happened today. And in fact, you know, one of my relatives uh, got a stroke a couple of days ago, and this person cannot be evacuated even to the shelter because the person is not movable. So the person is in the hospital in the city of Kyiv. These attacks are war crimes and violations of uh, the Rome Statute, whether you party to it or not. We are collecting these and other facts and will immediately send them to The Hague. And responsibility is inevitable. Nothing could justify today's deliberate, deliberate shelling by, Ru by a Russian warship of a Moldovan flagged chemical tanker with the Russian crew. Imagine or a Panamanian flag cargo ship near Odessa port in the Black Sea. It is a flagrant violation of international law of the sea. Is it a time to discuss historical reflections against the backdrop of the alarming situation in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant? seized by the Russian armed groups. They detain the staff of the nuclear power plant, not allowing them to rotate as required by technical safety rules. Another matter of alarm that the control levels of gamma radiation, those rates, in the exclusion zone have already been exceeded because of the damage of the topsoil due to the movement of a large number of heavy military equipment, including tanks. And as a result, uh, there is contamination by radioactive dust. Dear Security Council members, as of previous night, midnight, almost 140 persons were killed on the Ukrainian side and 316 persons wounded during this was the first day of uh, the Russian invasion. Many objects of civilian infrastructure were ruined. To stop the advance of the Russian tanks, A young gentleman, a hero, blew himself on a bridge. He killed himself to destroy the bridge, not to let the Russian tanks to go ahead. But the destruction takes place not only in cities. 80% of infrastructure of the small town of Shastya, located on the government control part of Donbass, have been completely destroyed, according to the local administration. Occasionally, the name of the town is translated as happiness. That's actually the name of the town. Shastya, happiness. What a grotesque irony. It speaks volumes 
what kind of happiness the Russian Federation is bringing to Donbas, to Ukraine, to other nations. Sooner or later, if we continue to allow Russia to go ahead with its diabolical plan. And rest assured, Ambassador, there will be no hospitality to your troops on our territory. Ukraine has been executing its right for self-defense according to the Article 51. It's not the Russia that executes. Your perverse reading of the Charter is so sick that it's impossible to interpret. Calling occupational troops peacekeepers, claiming the right of self-defense, lunacy. The Russian troops are suffering heavy losses. Aircraft, helicopters, tanks, trunk, uh, trucks, and most importantly, personnel. You can stop the vote in this chamber. But what may stop the war is unfortunately the bodies and thousands of bodies of Russian soldiers that will be delivered to their mothers in Russia, whether you like it or not, because we have to defend our territories, we have to defend ourselves on our territory. Thousands of Ukrainians have already joined the Ukrainian army or territorial defense forces, and the resolve and dedication of civilians joining the territorial defense forces is the best proof that we will not surrender, even if you succeed to temporarily occupy additional chunks of our territory. Ukraine has broken diplomatic relations with Russia, something that had to be done eight years ago. We call on our partners to follow our example or to find other ways to severe relationships, diplomatic relationships with uh, Russia. We call on international organizations to ban or suspend the Russia's membership. The later has happened today, in fact, as the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe by overwhelming majority, I mean, it's almost like consensus, adopted the decision to suspend the Russian Federation from its rights to rights of representation in the Committee of Ministers and in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. In the first place, you had never, you shouldn't have been invited to the Council of Europe. You were invited to the Council of Europe, this temple of human rights in the middle of the Chechen war. In the very middle of the Chechen war, even before, before the Hasev Yurt agreements. For hypocritical political reasons, the Europeans then were of the opinion that it's better to invite you, and you were invited in the middle of the war, killing thousands and thousands of your own citizens in Chechnya. We count upon the proper reaction by the international community to medieval atrocities by Russia in Ukraine. For today, a number of countries have uh, already imposed sanctions on Russia, and the burden must be heavy. And if you say that sanctions is nothing, that I'm sure that the bodies of killed soldiers of Russia is not nothing, even if you are completely 
diabolical. We are sincerely grateful to the UN for its prompt decision to support the humanitarian response in Ukraine, as well as, highly, as, well as we highly commend the UN efforts to encourage major humanitarian donors to make additional funding available. I thank the Secretary General for his statement to this effect. And my, I have a plea. Stop harassing the Secretary General. Stop attacking him. Show respect to the institution. Stop wiping your feet of the Secretary General, who is a very nice person and a dedicated supporter of the UN Charter. We remain open for negotiations, but don't put words in our mouths. Don't manipulate with our statements about negotiations. We are sick of your interpretations. Speak on your own behalf. Do not speak on our behalf. This was this stated by the President of Ukraine that we are open to negotiations on a permanent basis. And we have been saying that all along. It is you who killed Normandy 4. It is you who killed the Minsk agreements. All that gibberish about who said what and when in Normandy 4 by no means can justify the offensive. By no means can justify thousands and thousands of your troops on our territory. Your today's call of your president to the Ukrainian army to remove the government of Ukraine? Are you crazy? Show respect for the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Sovereign equality, non-use of force, or threat of force against territorial integrity, and political independence. In my opening remarks, I said that parents of ambassadors here, all ambassadors but you, are proud of their children. And children of the ambassadors are proud of their parents. It's so painful to think what your family think about you when you lie every day. The Russian people deserve peace, democracy. The Russian people deserve liberty, and they will have it. If not tomorrow, because tomorrow is not possible, then probably in the near future. Thank you. The list of speakers is exhausted. Prior to concluding today's meeting, I wish to comment just on one thing and to calm members of the Council. There was a, a lot uh, uh, to comment on, on the uh, uh, representative of uh, Ukraine, I will leave the abortionist at, at his conscience, on his conscience. This is a matter of his conscience, that is the abortionist with which he has addressed the council. But I say one thing. This is a report yesterday. The Russian Defense Ministry, yesterday, 24 February, uh, the units of the Russian Paratrooper Division uh, took full control of area in the Chernobyl nuclear power uh, plant area. Military services uh, uh, took the uh, you, by Ukraine, uh, an agreement was reached to, uh, about the joint provision of security for the sarcophagus and other uh, units in the uh, uh, power plant. We do not want Ukraine to generate a dirty bomb. The representatives of the uh, Defense Ministry noted that personnel of the stations, uh, stations continue to carry out service there, and they are monitoring the radioactive situation. The ra their, a radioactive situation, and this is a report from uh, Vienna. The level of radiation in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant is low. The threat to population does not exist. This was announced on Friday by the uh, Director General of the IAEA. The list of speakers is closed. The meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>